Welcome to Screen Quest, a podcast where a fellowship of film lovers and armchair movie experts plays film roulette. I'm one of your hosts, Chris Waterman, joined by May Finch. Hello, hello. And Will Rotondi. What is going on, sir? Not a whole heck of a lot. <laughs> on today's episode, we are going to be talking about the Akira Kurosawa adaptation of Macbeth called Throne of Blood. Very excited to get into that as it's one of my Shakespeare, our favorite Shakespeare plays, I should say. And it is uh, the first time I've seen this particular Kurosawa film. We'll also be drawing a side quest in our recently refreshed side quest deck. I have added the new cards in as we discussed. So, um, of course, naturally, we're going to draw an old one, I'm sure. <laughs> now that I've thrown that out into the universe. Inevitably. And- yeah, absolutely. That's just how it works here, right? Like we uh we talk about a movie and then like we draw it in the the deck or like, you know, we jinx ourselves by saying um that we have new side quest cards and we won't draw one for a month. Um sorry. I'm I'm calling it in advance. Um but first, uh I wanted to have a little chat with you guys about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So, uh this past weekend uh ant-man quantum mania i think is what it's called you don't even know uh came out (laughs) and it got me thinking Uh, i can recall a time not too long ago where every single marvel release was a very big deal you would see lots of engagement on social media um you know in addition to the advertisements and people would talk about it like relentlessly what was in the end credits what kind of revelations were in the movie like um who are the new characters introduced and i feel like almost overnight that is completely evaporated i know myself i didn't see black panther wakanda forever um not really like intentionally like snubbed it just didn't get around to it opening weekend and then sort of fell off my radar um and then like i started watching it on disney plus fell asleep and uh i don't know how strong my inclination to finish it actually is not to say it's a bad movie. Um, I do kind of want to see it through just because of, you know, it, more than anything, it's like a, a, a nice, um, albeit like financially motivated, uh, cash uh, motivated, wh- whatever you want to call it, um, tribute to Chadwick Boseman. But they did a really nice, lovely intro to it. But um, for that reason alone, I feel like maybe I will finish it. But any of it. How do you guys feel about that? Do you think the excitement for Marvel has died down significantly? Like, have we have we burst the Marvel bubble here? Like, or is the Marvel bubble burst, I guess? is a better way to phrase that. So I feel like when you're telling stories, even in this expanded format of an entire cinematic universe, there becomes a fine line between having an engaging and like interestingly complex set of characters and plots and it just being a tangle of wet noodles Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I think that the line was finally crossed and there's just too many characters too much has happened to easily keep track of and unless you're someone who is maybe like a diehard comic book fan um, I, I think it's just hard to keep up with now and also you've kind of reached a point where um this this is especially the case with something like a superhero movie you've saved the world so many times you've saved the universe so many times the stakes don't feel real anymore interesting points i uh i have a couple things to respond to but first will go for it i'm gonna play devil's advocate a little bit um i actually don't have marvel like fatigue as much as i feel like you guys probably do but i also sort of tempered my expectations after endgame where i was just like this was like a colossal story that they were finally able to find they stuck the landing on and it was amazing but you're right may it's like once you've done something that's so grand how are you going to top it and how convoluted is it going to get to get from point a to point b um so i think in some respects you sort of need i don't want to call it like filler films but i feel like some i think the criticism is that a lot of the movies are just cgi you know like uh i'm trying to think about the best way to describe it but just like a bunch of cgi maybe some basic plot and then you just sort of kind of get lost in feeling like you've seen it all before 
Um, I think for the people that are out there who know like all the history of the comic books, probably are still thrilled by it. And I encourage them to go out and enjoy it and compare and contrast what it was like with the stories they've grown up with. Um, and I'll still show up and watch it because I feel like even the even the Marvel movies that I found that I didn't think were like amazing, I was still never disappointed in. Like I always went in and I thought, you know what? It was fun for certain points. May not have been the best or kept my attention the whole way through, but I still enjoyed it just because it's, you know, for me, it's popcorn. I just go in and I just want to be entertained. And so I think that for me, I'm less critical of them. Um, and I think in some ways, maybe we could even, it, this might be a stretch to compare it, but I feel like this for me was like growing up with Star Trek, where Star Trek films sort of always tried to one up each other. And there's like the whole joke about like every other Star Trek movie is a good one. <laughs> and then the other ones in between are crappy. That's an, and, an immutable law of the universe, by the way, two. Four, yeah. Six. yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, so it's like. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so it was sort of like it's the same thing where you're just like, eh, you know, you've seen it before or they've tried this before and they're always trying to one up it so that it became more action than like space exploration. And so then it's, you know, when the stakes are progressively higher, how do you go higher than that without feeling like a broken record? So I can see it from both angles, but I think ultimately I'll still man, I'll still show up and Ant-Man. I hear a lot of criticism about the third one, man. So I'm hesitant, but I still want to see it because I feel like that was the when that first movie came out, that was the one underdog that like impressed everybody. Like everybody thought it was going to be a, a terrible film and the first one was great. So I don't know. I'll give it a shot. Yeah. And to be clear, like, listen, like nobody here on this podcast, as we've hopefully established, is a snob. Like if you enjoy it, like go enjoy that thing. Like please don't let us be the ones to uh remove like the little tiny sliver of joy in your life that might be the, the mcu yeah um, i'm getting ready to go see cocaine bear so i really can't yeah. turn up my nose at anything Hell yeah. <laughs> um i just i don't know so i i kind of agree with with both of you um in in and the, the following way so may i'm with you like um i think where i sort of started dropping off like personally is like the the moment that it felt like homework and I started getting anxiety about not keeping up with like the TV shows uh, and then being like, shit, I have to watch like two seasons of two very different TV shows to understand like who this person is or like this plot point. And then there's also like a movie. Um, I, I think like when it was a little simpler, like two movies like coming out a year, like one in like the, you know, fall one in the summer it was a little more doable i guess like for lack of a better word for somebody who enjoyed the mcu but maybe wasn't as hardcore about it where now there is sort of a sense i think from a lot of people myself included that there's a punishment factor to not engaging in just the massive amount of content that's churned out um, it seems like Disney's kind of figured that out a little bit because like things have really tapered off like this year for the release schedule and they're really pumping the brake on subsequent, um, you know, years and like pushing back like some of the release dates and things like that. Uh, where I agree with Will is like I, I've always enjoyed sort of like I, the stakes have always been real. Like I remember a theater full of people crying at the end of Infinity War when everyone's turning into dust and floating off into the breeze and I was just like, I, I, it's the cynical side of me where I was like, uh, he's only had one movie. She's only had one movie. There's a contract for three more for that person. Like <laughs> these people are not dead. Like, what are you worried about? Like, I just like, I, you know, I, it didn't affect me in the same way. I thought it was brilliant. I love that. Like it's a, the villain winning at the end is like, it's like some, some empire strikes back shit. I thought it was really, really cool. Um, but I wasn't worried for a second that, uh, there was going to be any lasting effects. Right. So, um yeah i but i enjoy them nonetheless like i think even despite the fact that like i know that nine times out of ten like people are they, like are not gonna die the world is not gonna end blah, blah 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 like i enjoy sort of that template it's the hero with a thousand faces the hero's journey blah 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 like like all that is like it's familiar to us we seek comfort in it i'm fine with that um so uh, yeah I, have you noticed of like a big drop in your social media and like like just like the people around you like in terms of like excitement i feel like it's almost radio silent except for a couple of friends that i can always rely on for like 
every bit of pop culture anything and like other than that like nothing i feel like personally the people i know who have always been like huge marvel fans like back before there were even any movies like they're still with it and then sure. everyone else who was kind of like oh these are cool movies maybe i'll get into this they've dropped off okay so it sounds like we're on the same page uh a little bit of fatigue um look like I, I don't want like marvel movies like to go away like there's some people that are like just stop already and it's like no nah, i think there's a there's a place like for that i think maybe slowing it down a bit there might be a benefit to that and uh trying something new like there was like this grand moment in the middle of the pandemic when a show called wandavision came out and it was fucking weird and like i was there for it a hundred percent and then like by the time the final episode aired it was like typical marvel fair and i've never been so disappointed in my life like because uh, like it went from very experimental and and unusual to just like the same old same old i hope they are not afraid to get weird it's encouraging to know that like deadpool is going to be r-rated blade is going to be r-rated so like they're branching out in that way but i'd like to see them experiment a bit more and do unusual things like pre-disney marvel did some cool stuff like logan i just rewatched a couple of weeks ago man what a like stand alone like you don't have to know shit about the X-Men really like or have watched any of those movies and it, it's like still just a really, really brilliant movie. So here's hoping. And All to right. be clear, I don't want them to go away either. I just I want them to be better. And yeah. I I feel like uh somewhere culturally, like the purpose of criticism has somewhat been lost. I feel like when you criticize a thing, people assume you're trying to cancel it. And I'm like, no, I just want it to be better. <laughs> That's why I'm criticizing it. <laughs> otherwise i would just avoid it <laughs> it's a pretty good example of like the law of diminishing returns like playing out i think where like if you don't change the thing like it gets less and less exciting right because like it's it's more more the same so um yeah here's open we'll see uh who would like a side quest let's do it yeah do it do it do it do it one do fresh it. order I, I shall... of side quest please <laughs> I shuffled it before the podcast, but I'm shuffling it again, you know, as always, just to, to be on the straight and narrow. And look at that. It's an actual, like, legit, um, you know, new side quest. So there you go. Ooh. Um, All right. The card that I drew is Furry Friends. And our <laughs> prompt is the following. I got to pull this up on our little cheat sheet here. Talk about your favorite animal film star. Now, to be clear, it doesn't have to be like, you know, the actual animal that played it. But I'm assuming like this is <laughs> like a animal that's in a film like in that role. So, yes, discuss. OK, so I loved the movie Homeward Bound as yeah. a kid. Yeah, uh, I have since learned apparently uh, the working conditions for the animals were not great on that set. <laughs> Um, I don't remember the details if they actually like killed a pet, but I know there were injuries at least. Um, oh goodness. Yeah. Uh, anyway, well, that's so, a bummer. <laughs> yeah, big bummer. But as a kid, I loved. I I mean, I loved all the pets, but I really liked the. Um, uh, I think it was like a black and white bulldog. Just couldn't get a break. How was that chance? Wait, chance, yeah, yeah. The yeah. Michael J. Fox was character, it? right? There was Chance, Sassy, and then Shadow, right? Yep. Aww. So I love Chance and um yeah, I remember it being a very dramatic movie for me to watch as a kid too. Like I was I was real worried about them, especially with the, the porcupine encounter. Like that that oh, image geez. is still fresh in my, my brain. Oh goodness. Yeah. That was uh poor chance got into it, so to speak. So Yeah. He uh, you could say he didn't have a chance. No. 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 Sorry. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I, I love that as a kid. Um, have you I mean obviously you guys have seen the movie, you're referencing it, but uh what what were your experiences with it? Um I mean I just wonderful, like tons of fun. I didn't realize until like a couple of years after it came out and I'd watched the VHS like I don't know, like a dozen times that uh it was actually like a a remake. Um 
or reimagining of a film called The Incredible Journey, which mm-hmm. like was the same exact plot, but the animals didn't talk, right? Um, and it's a it's a very interesting side by side experience where like um I don't know, think of it like almost like a call of the wild, right? Like kind of thing where it's like clearly from the perspective of the animals, but no voice actors boring as shit for a kid but like right <laughs> uh kind of and i'm sure the working conditions probably weren't any better because i feel like that wasn't from the 70s but um yeah so i i don't know so i did watch that uh, my uh my stepfather was like oh like this was like a a movie that like disney made back in the day and it was called the incredible journey and homeward bound the incredible journey it was kind of like a nod to like that original title and um yeah, but uh, I loved like I mean Donna Michi, Sally Field, and Michael J. Fox, all great voice uh, actors, and um, they're pretty magical. Like I don't know how they coerce the animals. It sounds like not not in a great way, but like the uh, the, the personalities seemed to match the voices and stuff, which was pretty cool. So uh, my favorite was Shadow, like the Golden Retriever. So, how about you? Yeah. Will? yeah, I remember being really worried about Shadow. Cause you're like, oh, he's old. You might not make it. And then they're like, they're they're really leaving you hanging at the end. Like, mm, is he gonna come out of the bushes too, or did he get left behind? So yeah, I feel like that was definitely like the end of the film. Always kind of got to me. I feel like at some point, I probably felt bad for Sassy because she ends up stuck in the river and goes over a waterfall, and they think she's dead. Mm-hmm. So for the cat, I, yeah. I think there's moments where you think all of them are dead. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> or they're about to get like impaled. Yeah, yeah, it's very dramatic. Yeah, which I gotta tell you though, man. I mean, as much as like I'm sure the working conditions were terrible, I feel like there is no other film that I know of that is more of like a crime against animal kind than Milo and Otis. I had no idea just how many animals died for that film until oh, like God. recently. Like if you just if you Google how many animals died, I feel like Google search will ask you to auto complete in Milo and Otis. <laughs> and that's yeah, like, I've heard like and that's like, also a bummer because I loved that yeah. like growing up too. It was like one of those things right. that like similar kind of concepts, like for sure. But yeah, that's God, that's yeah, it's a bummer, man. Yeah. But yeah, Homeward Bound, I liked it. I think they made a sequel. They were in San Francisco. It was kind of entertaining, but you know, like sequels go (laughs) trying to do the same thing. Not as great, but still entertaining for a kid. But yeah, I have good memories of Homeward Bound. Um, Hopefully the animals eh, at the time were uh, not too bad, but yeah, that's the iffy part. That's the hard part. Yeah, I'm trying to find the like exact stories here and having a little trouble. I think that it was less egregious than the movie it's based on. So there's that at least. Ooh, I, I can believe it. Yep. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, uh, I love those animals, even if the film creators didn't. And <laughs> <laughs> that's my pick. That's right. Nice. I hadn't thought about that movie in a long time. So thanks for the little trip down memory lane there. You're welcome. Yeah. All right. Well, our main topic of the show today is Throne of Blood, uh, which, um, as we, I think, established, none of us had seen prior to this, which is kind of a rarity. Most of the time, like, I feel like at least one of us has seen the film. Um, Okay, so we're going to pretend like I did this at the top and we'll just cut this in um, (laughs) before I get the impressions. So for our audience, Throne of Blood is a 1957 film directed by Akira Kurosawa uh, starring Toshiro Mifune, Izuzu Yamada, and Takashi Shimura. And it is an adaptation of uh, Macbeth, as we said. Um, It drew upon um, some influences in Japanese culture, including no drama that's noh um which is something that i have as a topic of discussion so we'll kind of get into that but some of the more intentional choices um anything that seemed uh culturally different is probably drawing from that so the chanting for example at the beginning and the end of the film that is very much of that uh you know style of, of dramatic interpretation so yeah, there's your little blurb on 
uh, Throne of Blood, and I totally did not forget to do that, and I'm just editing this here, right? Totally didn't happen. <laughs> um, a lot of the discussion today is going to be freeform. Um, I do have a couple of uh, prompts, for lack of a better word, to help kind of generate some discussion. But of course, as always, I'd like to start with general impressions. So I'm going to go vertical on the screen. And first, we're going to go to, well, let me see who's actually vertical as I switch the view. See, I'm still getting used to that. Uh, yep, it's <laughs> going to be May Finch still. So May, go for it. Yeah, so I love Shakespeare. I was in a Shakespeare theater group for a while in college and took a lot of Shakespeare classes. And Macbeth is up there for her favorite plays. And yeah, I just thought this was a really creative reimagining. Uh, I appreciated the ways it diverged a bit from the play. Um, I thought that the use of imagery and symbolism was also really cool like seeing that in a in a Japanese context um yeah I I was impressed I will say like it took me a little bit of time to get into it like the the scene that it opens with when um I guess not the opening scene but early scene when Mashizu and his companion are just wandering and lost in the woods. I was kind of like waiting and waiting and waiting and wondering when the witch was going to appear. But uh, once once the witch was on screen, I was totally pulled in. Uh, I think overall, so if we're talking about our history with Shakespeare, first and foremost, I was an English major, but I was a terrible English major. So I've only read maybe a half of Shakespeare's stuff, if that that's probably generous on my part. There's and oddly enough, there. Macbeth has never, yeah, oddly enough, Macbeth is not one of them. I'm familiar with it in the sense of what it's about generally, but I've never watched it performed and I apparently need to get with the program. But uh, no, I still like the film. I think in some ways, depending on your, um, I will say this for any viewers that are looking for a certain pace of film, there may be points in this where you feel like it kind of drags on a little bit. Um, but overall, I still enjoyed it. Um, I think it is visually, it's a beautiful film. Um, I like some of the little camera tricks that they pull because I was curious, like how some of the shots were pulled off, you know, as you're watching it, like when like the clouds roll in and a castle suddenly appear or a fortress suddenly appears and um some of the, like the panning in shots where you kind of like you're guessing that something's going to change off screen and then it does and you get that nice little like payoff of it oh yeah i figured that was gonna you know they're gonna do something there that's cool um so like from a stylistic perspective that was fun to watch um and just i've always i always enjoy watching when because we in american culture we always see so much like of Hollywood repurposing storylines and ideas, you know, from other cultures. It's nice to finally see like somebody else doing a version of something like, I mean, granted, this is English history, um, but to just see their take on it and to see how they would, they would do that. And I, I think it was a great film. So. Awesome. Uh, first of all, I'm going to refute the fact that you were a bad English major because I was an English major at the same time you were at the same university. <laughs> and that is not true. Uh, there's only so much time in a day and so many, you know, weeks in a year and so on and so forth. Uh, but, um, anyway, uh, yes, I love this. It's my favorite Shakespeare play. Um, I think this is a stellar adaptation of Macbeth. I think it does a great job of capturing all of the substance that you would need to, to be identifiably Macbeth while still having a very strong cultural identity of its own. And I loved the the choices um, for the changes that were made when there were changes made to the, the source material. Uh, really, really worked for me. Um, same boat as May where uh, it's a little bit of a rough, not rough start. It's a, it's in a very intentional pacing um, at the beginning that kind of throws you off just a tiny bit. But once the story kicked off, um, you know, in earnest, I was riveted and, uh, you know, just just couldn't wait to to see how they were going to handle certain things that I knew were coming. And I was often surprised and delighted by the directions that they went. Um, we'll talk about it more in detail, but probably one of my favorite interpretations was like the Lady Macbeth of the movie, who I found to be just um, as chilling and <laughs> um, 
you know, impactful as I was hoping. I think Lady Macbeth is probably my favorite character in Macbeth for so many different reasons that we can talk about. But um, I was glad to see that they really nailed that aspect of it. Um, and yeah, I just enjoyed it a lot. I th- there's a lot of influence, I think, on the Cohen um, Macbeth with Denzel that, that I'm going to try to do some side by sides, I think, in the edit to kind of show um, in particular sort of the mistiness and uh, the black and white, obviously, photography, so, some of the more like minimalistic feel to it. Like, yes, we have big castles and things like that. But I do feel like um, there is a, a minimalist aspect, minimalist aspect to this that, uh, um, you know, feels very Shakespearean um, at times. And then kind of reducing the the witch down to uh, a single or the witches to, to a single entity. Um, very much uh, a similar thing between those two films. Um they, they, of course, get a little more like, uh, I think, creative in each of these to kind of make it feel like like almost like there's like multiple entities. Um, and we'll get into that. But yeah. Um, so, all right. For our first proper topic, what I wanted to talk about is your favorite change from the source material. Now, Will, I know you said you're not as familiar with Macbeth, so don't feel bad if you um, if you don't necessarily know where that change may be um that's okay like we we can figure something else out for that but may i'll I'll start with you on this one do you have a favorite change of um that the film did something that's different from the original source material uh i really liked the facts and i i didn't understand plot wise quite why they had to do this i guess just because they were hosting but right before the uh lord washizu serves under is killed uh, they have to switch rooms to stay in that bloodstained room from someone who had committed, you know, suicide out of shame. And I thought that was a great detail. And there is such a foreboding and also a bit of foreshadowing with the like bloodstain in the background as Lady Macbeth or Lady Washizu is sitting there. And there's also that wall of arrows behind them, which is later how Washizu dies. Yeah. So that that's... was just great window dressing on the scene yeah so much of um uh, the, well, I, I so one of the interesting facts that i kind of read about when i was doing some research was the um even the the emblems on the flags that they have are uh foreshadowing pieces of information for where those characters so the rabbit i guess the symbol of like fertility um is used to sort of uh foreshadow the fact that uh Miki's uh, son is going to like you know um, play an important role in the story, and then Washizu has a centipede, which is traditionally a symbol of evil in mm-hmm. Japanese mythology and culture, which I did not know. Um, so that was kind of interesting, kind of cueing the audiences. I'd be curious, like 1957 Japanese audiences, like how much they would be dialed into that. I'm imagine quite a bit, like it seems like, but um, I found that very very cool. Uh, how about you will like like i don't know like on a scale of mm. one to ten with like ten you're an expert one you've never heard of it like where you would rank yourself like on the familiarity with Macbeth, but Oof, um, probably a two <laughs> a two okay okay so like pretty far down there instead mm. what we'll do uh is this like um did you have a favorite piece of like iconography like in uh, mm. the film like I mean, I know, if, I, I guess I could start with what I do that I did recognize which was when um and I apologize, I am blanking on her name, so I'm going to look it up. That's fine. We'll cut all around. Uh, Lady Asaji Washizu. When she is um, she's trying to wash her hands because she can't get the blood out. And I'm like, ah, <laughs> I get that. <laughs> like the one or two references. I'm like, mm, okay, good. I'm not yeah, I'm not completely out. But um I think I just liked her in general because she just had crazy eyes the entire movie. And then when she was like shuffling around everywhere, the sound effect that she had in her robe when she's like shuffling around trying to give people wine and then shuffling around trying to get that spear. And (laughs) And I almost found it sort of comical in a weird, dark way. But um, I liked her character, the way that she was portrayed. I feel like we're going to talk more about her, though. So I'm going to step back on that. Um... I liked when Washizu was sort of like reprimanding himself for being a fool and he's looking at his sword. Uh, Something about that scene and just sort of the kind of the the minimalist design, but also just the the framing of the shot I enjoyed. 
Very nice. But I can't speak more to it than that. I just really it's okay, man. Something about it. I thought it was a very beautiful shot. Um, I do like how they sort of pan in and out to like change things. So like when the, you know, the witch in the woods is like suddenly there's that little sort of like structure of the it's sort of like a frame for a hut without being one that you can see through and then it disappears when the camera zooms in and comes out so it's sort of like stage changes with set design in some respects that kind of made it feel a little bit more like a play um or if like you, if you look up like a, <laughs> a no stage like like that is yeah. like right lifted from like what an audience would be familiar with like Mm. the there's always a roof like over parts of the the stage like it's tra mm -hmm. a traditional thing and it's always open so that you can see like the the set changes and things like that happen like even when people are supposed to be off stage so there's no curtains there's no like stage right stage light. it's all like open like that um so I encourage you to google that i'll put a an image in here but um i'm glad you you brought that up because um that is very much i think supposed to ev evoke like this is what this is i would probably need some options to compare it to of like the the major changes in the storyline to really have more for it than that so that's that's on me unfortunately <laughs> no it's all good D uh did you notice as a star wars fan like the transitions the wipes oh yeah were, yeah <laughs> this is like yeah you're like yeah you're like yeah. george lucas must have seen a, a Kurosawa film or two, uh, as we talked about off mic with uh, the Hidden Fortress, which is like the template for Star Wars. But yep, yeah, classic. Uh, for me, my favorite change was the ending. I think the uh, the arrow scene was absolutely mm. wild and just mm. um, a really kind of satisfying way um, for the film to come to an end. I think. You know, having a one on one sword battle with McDuff, um, who I don't think there's really like an a analogous character in this film, um, would have been kind of cool, but this is so much better, like in some ways, just because it's a, a bunch of soldiers who are like, nah, man, like we're not even going to engage in this battle. That forest has come alive, like you're going to lose anyway, like, why should we die? Also you're you're uh you know you, you want to yell about being a treacherous dog like that's you and then just whew. um i read that like in that particular scene like those are real arrows that are being shot like at him and he, i'm sure you noticed like when he was like kind of like swiping at them like as they're in the wall that was him indicating to the archers like the direction that he was going to move so they wouldn't like hit him with the arrows which is like that's pretty badass, man. Um, I think some or most of them were on a wire to kind of like minimize like the potential for accidents, but still pretty cool nonetheless. Um, but I, I just that scene is so great, quite uh, quite bloody too. I think like the the final arrow going into the neck would have been probably yeah. pretty scandalous for fifties audiences. So that's my favorite change. Um. Of course, we're going to follow this up with do, uh, what is your favorite um, sort of like, you know, we'll say more or less like faithful version of something that appears in Macbeth. So I'll turn it back over to May. Uh, I appreciate that. Also, sorry, my, my, my dog is being talkative again today. Um, I really appreciated that uh, even though they did minimize like the witches to a single kind of spiritual entity, they kept the entity's kind of androgyny um, because mm -hmm. that was an important aspect of the original. Macbeth comes upon the witches and is like, well, you guys, you, you look like chicks, but you have beards and then just kind of moves on. <laughs> <laughs> you can't figure it out. Yep. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, no, I appreciate that the spiritual entity was kept kind of androgynous with like the deep voice and kind of nondescript uh clothing and appearance um i think that it was interesting though that washizu was much more aggressive than Macbeth was upon seeing this witch i was gonna say i have kind of a follow-up question since i am unfamiliar with Macbeth, um uh, is so you mentioned that he's more aggressive with the witch is he as easily manipulated by everyone around him in the play because it seems like he just kind of like he's always got this shocked look on his face in this film and then just other people just start doing stuff and he's just like all right i guess that's what i'm going with you know <laughs> so is it kind of the same way in the play where he just sort of 
He's like, these so, are my options now, apparently. <laughs> Macbeth and, and you know, of course, like um, by association, this film deals with like, it's like a classic setup for fate versus free will. Mm-hmm. And the character of Macbeth, regardless of how you feel about like that question, um, I think pretty unequivocally like surrenders himself to the idea of like, this is like my destiny and i'm going to just like go full fledged like because this is what the prophecy says i'm meant to do and who i'm meant to be with with like very little resistance to that idea so i think they do a great job in the film of kind of embracing that as well where it's like well what especially once um you know like lady Macbeth um or uh what do we say asaji is that, is that how you say her mm-hmm. name um so. kind of uh have that conversation like he's he's like in it like all the way to the end so yeah very influential or i should say what's the word impressionable to the ideas of others for sure yeah yeah because i kind of felt like he was sort of like that was who he looked to like even if he didn't necessarily agree with her he was still just going to follow what she did and when she went ahead and made the first step then it's like okay well i'm committed to it now and so okay well if that's if that's how it is in the play then i'd say that <laughs> i i got that pretty strongly in the film <laughs> yeah in in her defense like the i'm trying to remember the exact arguments lady Macbeth makes in the original play but lady asaji she's very convincing frankly like especially with that concept of fate she kind of says well even if it isn't fate other people know about the prophecy and if you don't make this happen, people are going to assume you're going to anyway. So you, you might as well do it. They will kill you, right? Like, yeah. yeah. Nice. Uh, did you have anything you wanted to add as in terms of what what you, I know you mentioned already, like the kind of the out damn spot um, reference with her washing her hands. Anything else that like you you noticed like from your minimal like pop culture <laughs> exposure to, to uh, Macbeth? No, maybe it is just one thing. That was like the big thing that I was just like, okay, yeah, I get that. But uh, yeah, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that really stood out, but probably not. There. Nah, I'm going to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> hey, listen, uh, I know like uh, there's a complicated history with Roman Polanski, um, who, uh, you know, um, has done some terrible, terrible things. But if you're able to separate the art from the artist, Um, I would say probably my favorite Macbeth adaptation is the Roman Polanski. Um, I think it was Playboy produced. Like there was like a hot minute where they were doing stuff. Um, It is fabulous and disturbing and not a coincidence. Probably it's the first film he made after Sharon Tate was murdered. And um, it has like some really, really striking images. And it's probably like one of the best um adaptation so if you if you want to like know like my opinion like the definitive one to watch if you can separate the art from the artist go that route if you can't understandable watch probably the the denzel one um i would say is like my um second favorite and there's a really great uh shot that kind of i won't spoil how but they like kind of bring the three witches back even though there's like one um, Mm. entity so um but yeah, I would I would encourage you to watch like another version, especially with the original language intact too, because I think it's just uh, it's really really good and still works um, all these years later. Uh, for me, like my favorite scene is by far the banquet uh, scene. So um, Mickey, uh, like the the spirit of Mickey, again, you can make the argument, and people often do. Like, is this his guilt and conscious like conscience um, manifesting itself? Is it an actual spirit? Like, what's the deal there? But like uh, watching, um, you know, that total meltdown and freak out is just uh, really, really well done in this. I, 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 um, I think uh, Mifune in particular just like sells that. But I mean, like, you know, uh, hats off to um, Izuzu Yamada who played uh, Asagi um for like really doing her damnedest like to just be like oh he's just drunk like it's fine you know like oh like he's had a, he's a little too much sake um but i got yeah, it's always been one of my favorite scenes in the play as well because you see sort of the the toll this has taken wh- whether it's real or not like you see the toll that like the deeds have started to take on his uh soul and it's a, it's a great turning point i think runner-up that would be the forest um coming to 
is it just called the Forest Castle? But it's Castle Castle Dunsany in the the play, but the Forest Castle, like the actual forest moving. Um, there's like a very logical explanation for it, like in both um iterations of this, but um it's just a really cool shot and uh yeah, it's neat. Cool. All right. Well, hey, thanks for sharing on that. I did want to kind of highlight some elements of uh the no um like I guess art form really quick since we did touch on it for a second. And then I wanted to talk or uh, open it up. I should say for anything that you guys wanted to talk about, including characters and things like that. Uh, so we mentioned the, the way the stage looks. And again, I'm going to put a photo in here so that our audience can kind of get a, a look on YouTube. If you watch it there, um, very reminiscent of what the witch's hut looks like, which is very cool. But for our audio listeners, if you can imagine a Japanese style roof, um, over four pillars that have no walls like whatsoever around there. So it's a very open space. Um, you'll have, uh, I think, a sense of it. One of the things that I saw was like, so there's uh, five main themes uh, for no plays. The one that this would probably fall into is uh, Shura Mono, which is a warrior play. Um, and this is from Wikipedia. So take it with a heaping pinch of salt. But um, characteristics in, uh, include a protagonist appearing as a ghost of a famous samurai pleading to a monk for salvation and the drama cu culminates in a glorious reenactment of the scene of his death in a full war costume so that seemed to be the closest that I could find um, you know uh, as far as uh, where you would kind of draw the uh, I, I guess like connection between no as an art form and uh, this film because they mention at the end that his spirit is still out there and he is obviously in full like military dress when he meets his demise but um yeah so there's a little bit more trivia what would you guys like to talk about is there a particular character or scene that really stood out to you again i wanted to kind of keep this um you know a little free form and we'll kind of tie it in a bow for do we think it's a successful Shakespeare adaptation at the end? That'll be kind of our grand conclusion. So, I mean, I think everyone wants to talk about Lady Asaji. So that might yeah. be a, a natural place to start. I was blown away by, like, she's she's a little uncanny from the first time you see her on screen. Just her movements, the stillness of her face. And I, I imagine a lot of that was just to show deference to her husband. But it's just it comes across as very eerie because it's so she looks so meek and jaded but the words she's saying are quite dark and manipulative and it's just very jarring and strange and then uh, i think like the most unsettled i felt was after she has confirmed or at least confirmed with herself uh that the murder is going to take place and leaves to go get the wine and there's this fantastic shot of this just pitch black doorway that she just kind of smoothly shuffles into and disappears and then it lingers for a while and I was thinking it was just going to cut and then nope she comes right back <laughs> with the wine and it was kind of a jump scare for me I don't know about you guys <laughs> <laughs> no she's straight up something out of like a japanese horror film like yeah. like genuinely like uh no right so there with you that that sold it for me and then um yeah just the fact that even her ladies in waiting seem terrified of her as well <laughs> like she is an unsettling and imposing figure despite um like taking up very little physical space and like moving quite elegantly it's creepy and wonderful like Lady Macbeth in another time and place, like I have a feeling she would be the one in charge, probably. You get oh, that absolutely. Sense. She um, was always like looking off into nowhere too. It's kind of like off in the corner, just like staring at the ground, and then she would start saying something, and <laughs> like, okay, cool. <laughs> like you've just been sitting here ruminating on this for a while, right? You know. And, I do wonder uh, if that is slightly a cultural difference, just. Like, like eye contact can be seen as like rude right mm. or disrespectful um so like, it could be partly that but it is also unsettling compared to all the other characters that do make at least an effort at eye contact or like looking near each other yeah like the guards that are kind of having that back and forth and and basically sharing gossip about what's been going on and if they think that 
Washizu is really responsible for the deaths that have taken place. And, you know, there, so that seemed like very like familiar camaraderie. Whereas for her, she's just like always, she's very still, you know, very, that very still po- uh, posture. And regardless of whether like Washizu is just like, I don't know, it's like he's also doing the same thing, just looking in a different direction. And so they're just miserable ruminating about things, about what they have to do. And I think that it was, uh, I don't know. I think what was striking and whether or not it's similar or not and sort of the language from the the original play, but when she makes the comment to Wishizu about like, I didn't do all this just for you to give away the throne. (laughs) You know, like we're in it now. You committed. You can't just change your mind. And then throws in that little thing about I am pregnant. And I'm like, ooh, all right. (laughs) That was convenient. Conveniently timed. A little uh, truth bomb there. But uh yeah just everything that she did about it was always like "Mm, watch out (laughs) don't do it man but uh, yeah she's my favorite character i I mean don't get me wrong washizu has like also has his own version of crazy eyes and and like intense like cleon yelling all the time but like if we want to continue the star trek theme from earlier but uh (laughs) man asagi is my favorite (laughs) I kind of wonder just because the timing of that, oh, by the way, I am with child is is so interesting. I wonder if she actually like was sure of that or if she just kind of said it <laughs> like hopefully I am because presumably she wasn't even showing and there's no pregnancy tests, I think, in that time period. So <laughs> I wouldn't put it past her to yeah. hope for the best. To pretend. Yeah. Very so that would be interesting too. Like, if she was pretending that, then did she pretend to be ill when she supposedly lost the child? Because that could also, I could see that track. You know, she's willing to poison people with some, you know, some spiked wine. That... Did prevent him from going to her after the, you know, <clears throat> supposed miscarriage or stillbirth. Yeah. I, don't know. I really like her makeup design. Um, mm-hmm. She almost has like, um, so like it reminded me of like, uh, you know, you gotta use your imagination, but a little bit, but like Oni, um, horns. If you know what like Oni, like the kind of Japanese uh, demon, like with like the pale oh. face, and there was like these like sort of um, horn like uh, stripes like on her forehead. If I'm not totally making that up, I'm pretty sure uh, that is true. But I hold while I Google. Yes. She does. Um, and it's like, it's. I'm going to put this like particular photo because it's like terrifying that I just found. Um, but I think like it gives her almost like a demon like quality, um, which is interesting because, you know, a lot of the supernatural elements of the play pretty much are always like rooted in the witch. But I think she's got something almost ethereal to her, like in terms of this like portrayal of um, the Lady Macbeth character. And uh, it's a little unsettling for sure. Um, I do think it's interesting. Like I was trying to rack my brain um, aside from when they're in like the banquet hall. Do we really ever see her like interact with like any of the other characters or guests or anything like that? Like I was trying to rack my brain if like when they come back to the castle, she's playing host at all. Or if it's pretty much just you see her, um, you know, and like her um like they're sort of like the husband wife thing and then like just the one banquet i'll see do you guys remember i think that was about it i mean besides when they after the murder of the of their um i forget what they called the was it just the lord like their lord i can't remember the 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 yeah she's out in the they gave him courtyard yeah, but in terms of like screaming, yeah. interactions like it almost kind of like she, she almost then becomes like um the devil on his shoulder right where like yeah mm-hmm. other characters are aware of her but um i don't know it's uh it's just it's very very creepy i'm Definitely. gonna push back on that slightly just because there i think there is a very tragic human element to her and sure. part of it is whether or not she was actually pregnant she's not able to birth her husband and heir right and i mm. think that's a large part of what drives her kind of like misplaced ambitions because 
her kind of role, her success looks like giving birth to a male heir and she can't do that. So she puts all of that energy and anxiety onto her husband and pushing him to go as far as he can. Oh yeah, don't get me wrong. Like I'm, uh, she's got plenty of uh, of motivations, but I guess I meant more in like terms of like uh, you know inner interactions. Like she's, um, I mean, really not anything original with um, with the story of Macbeth, but she's almost like the the puppet master, like with the the strings. Like she's able to very very easily manipulate, um, you know, uh, all sorts of really 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 terrible. Uh, deeds and yet like as much as you see um i don't know why i keep like in uh washizu uh freaking out on the banquet hall and stuff she seems to also have i think arguably even more of a tortured soul as you see her washing her hands and that's like always been a, a lasting image like with the uh, portrayals of lady Macbeth. so um uh what do, what do you guys make of this like overall as a shakespeare adaptation did, did it feel shakespearean to you even if you've not seen macbeth well so i'll po- pose this question to you first did it does it feel shakespearean to you yes because uh because of tragedy because it feels like the fate the fates conspire despite the good and the bad intentions of characters that they ultimately all lose in the end and so yeah when everybody ends up dead it's pretty much a shakespeare tragedy right <laughs> <laughs> Less people end up dead in this adaptation, I feel like, than um, in some. Like, uh, I'm trying to think if there's any, like, less bodies because um, there's characters that don't make it over to this film. But uh, Mm -hmm. anyway, I'll I'll ruminate on that a little bit. But you are correct. Like, the tragic (laughs) element definitely does translate uh, across cultures or cultures. Yep. I do have to ask before we we move on so like is there any sort of like like the symbolism at the beginning where they you see the pillar in sort of like memoriam of the lost fortress is that is there anything like that in the play or is that completely added in for their own version not that i can recall i think it okay. starts with two guards that are drunk talking about how alcohol um, is both great and terrible because it makes you randy, but like you can't perform. I'm pretty sure that's how it opens up. Um, So it's a very different tone at the beginning of it. Like there's a lot of comedy and then that like quickly goes away. Like it's almost sort of like the false start that like primes you to like be a little more relaxed and then like it gets very bloody very quickly, but I could be wrong. Do you remember anything like that? Like in the, the play? So I... slightly different phallic imagery in this film. Okay. Yeah, yes. I got you. I got you. I mean, well, that I is then... another key element of Shakespeare is the phallic imagery. <laughs> mm. yeah. Well, with that in mind, I mean, and uh, my only other thought was when I saw that and I'm like, oh, so everybody literally has been dead for a while. The entire place is demolished. And I'm like, okay, tragedy. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, that's all I got. It, it is kind of Shakespearean sometimes to have like, you know, oftentimes it's like the form in the form of a character's like soliloquy or something like where they like kind of tie everything together. And the the chanting and singing felt like that, where it's like kind of setting the stage and then wrapping it up at the end. So I think that's a good observation. How about you, May? Did you uh, think this was a, a successful and recognizable Shakespeare? Uh, you know, I said at the last episode, I kind of cheated by saying like, I'm putting this forth as like a genre but i feel like shakespeare is kind of a genre unto itself because people have adapted so many shakespeare plays and done interesting things so i feel okay with it i mean yeah i'd agree with you just because so few plays of that era it like exist today that aren't shakespearean plays so like i think it was part of a larger genre that just kind of disappeared (laughs) so now it's the shakespeare genre but yeah the 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 tragic um hero right that that's not unique to shakespeare necessarily you see that in a ton of like greek plays um but that does feel very shakespearean nonetheless and that's exactly what you see here i agree with everything will said about that you're kind of um sealing your death in early in the movie through some you know reckless action right or just ill-fated action 
So yeah, it, it felt very Shakespearean. I think the only thing that didn't was one, the lack of dick jokes and two, <laughs> uh, the uh, lack of like, um, I don't know, like more monologuing, like the the monologues that we get between Washizu and Mickey, uh, sorry, no mickey but uh lady washizu are fantastic and like you do get some good banter between mickey and washizu but i i felt like it was a little light on dialogue overall yeah i think that's totally fair um seems to be more interested in like using images to convey we had those long stretches i know may you and i talked like again off mic about just the opening uh marianne um exclaimed like will somebody do something during the uh the spirit scene and then <laughs> went to sleep she took a nap the rest of the movie after that so i think that's fair um and honestly like as far as adaptations go like i'm i'm okay with that i think like you should be faithful to the material but often like the shakespeare play adaptations that work the best are the ones that aren't afraid to like go out on a limb sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't but oh comes to mind for example the adaptation of othello with uh mckay pfeiffer and josh hartnett which is great sets it in a private school and it's about basketball players like and you know like kind of scales it down to a very different time and place abandons the language and all that so i think that's fair though <laughs> um yeah for me i mean i i think it feels properly shakespearean in the the tragedy for sure um the lack of communication uh between characters that might be able to work something out is the thing that definitely like you're making an awful lot of assumptions um you wonder if you go hey this like crazy spirit out in the woods uh said this was gonna happen i got no intention of doing that like you just promoted me like to to castle one or whatever or northern castle whatever it was like i'm cool dude just so you know i'm good like thank you appreciate it <laughs> i'm out right like how many problems could be solved in a shakespeare play if people would just have a conversation right um that's a pretty common theme um I think sort of like the the uh, nature imagery um, in the form of like the forest coming to the castle is like really, really powerful. I'm glad they kept that in. Um, but that's something you see a lot in Shakespeare in general, not just like the forest coming to the castle, but like the uh, like the the, the nature imagery um, had that classic Kurosawa rain. So I was glad that we got a scene with that because like he loves his rain and his thunderstorms. So he put his own little kind of spin on that, um, which I uh, appreciated. Um, I think probably like the one thing for me, if I'm being honest, that was like was lacking. So may you mentioned like a lack of dick jokes. I think a lack of humor in general, like, and I know he's capable of it because I've seen lots of his films. I would have liked to have seen a little bit more levity, especially on like the front side of the film. Um, Cause I think like that is maybe an aspect of the Shakespeare that didn't fully try. Like it's pretty serious all the way through. Right. Like I'm trying to think if there's any like actual, like funny like moments and I'm coming up blank on that, but I'll, if you guys remember something, I'll take it. I feel like it's important to note too that uh, this is a work in translation. So there could be fun like wordplay that we're missing out on just because we're yes. viewing it in English. That is a very good point. Yeah, for sure. Uh, but overall, I would rate this as a successful adaptation. And what I personally want, like, it's always fun to see like the 100th you know, version of like the play, like in its original like form with all the language intact in film form. Like it's cool to see what people do with that. But like personally, I find stuff like this to be more exciting where there's like some liberties taken and you find a way to like reimagine the story. Um, but successful or unsuccessful? What do you think? <laughs> I get I a thumbs successful. up for me. Yeah. Successful. And I get a nod <laughs> and a successful from Will. All right. I'll take it. <clears throat> well, um, with that being said, uh, Will has prepared uh, some Akira Kurosawa trivia for me and I. So I'm going to turn it over to him briefly. And then, of course, we'll draw a card to see ourselves out for the week. But uh, we'll Sweet. take it away. Sounds good. Yeah, I was just thinking about, man, what they lacked in dick jokes, they made up for in arrows by the end of that film. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so many arrows. 
<laughs> okay. Thousands so, of dicks. <laughs> I know, yes. <laughs> Flying through the air. <laughs> Murderous dicks. <laughs> One right through his neck. Oh, but anyway. Um, so very much in the style of May and her trivia, I have decided to do my uh my take my own shot at, at doing this. So uh, I've got a few questions for you. Uh, I'm honored. Mostly, uh, yeah, yeah. Hopefully, I do you the honor. We haven't gotten through it yet. <laughs> you can tell me afterwards. You're like, this is this is shit. But um, uh, yes, but I've got most of them are kind of open ended, or I shouldn't say open ended. I I won't be giving options. Ones I'll give you some hints to it, like uh, multiple choice, and then one true false, and so we'll go from there. But cool. All righty. So my first question for you is, um, Throne of Blood is not the only film that Kurosawa made that's based on the works of Shakespeare. What other play was used for another one of his films? I think I said this last episode, so there's a, depending on how good your memory is, but it may not have as well. Maybe it just popped up here, but I know this, so I'm going to go second. I have no idea. So I'm just going to guess the most famous play and say Hamlet. It is King Lear, and the film is Rand, which is in color. And I uh, haven't seen it, but like I've seen enough uh, screenshots from it that like I can't wait to watch it. It looks beautiful. Yep, Chris, you are correct. I don't know. I felt for I a minute like maybe you were trying detail. to do like. Yeah, <laughs> I was like, I feel like he he could be pu- trying to pull an Asagi right now and just be like, I yes, I know the answer to this, you know. <laughs> but, but maybe you do, yeah. But no, uh, you are correct, and yes, for the film. And actually, the more that we've like talked about Kurosawa films, both on and off the podcast, I feel like I need to go back and watch some more because I've seen Hidden Fortress. It's been a while. Uh, Chris and I had mentioned that to each other earlier, but. Um, like Rashomon or Seven Samurai or um, Ran, uh, definitely want to. I think I, I feel like it's time to brush up on some. Uh, Start with cinema. Seven Samurai, like please, yeah. like that. That yeah. is one that is just like okay. it moves and it stays moving. It, it might be three hours, but like it is just excellent all the way through. Like it is just genuinely like one of the greatest stories ever told. Like really, really good. Nice, copied to death. So yeah. <laughs> Yeah, newly noted. Yeah, I feel like I've seen the versions of that since, but I haven't seen the original, so I will definitely have to get back. Bugs Life. Is the yeah, man. <laughs> most uh, approachable <laughs> version of that story, but yeah. <laughs> Love it. Question number two. Uh, so I apologize if I mispronounce his name, but Toshiru Mufune, who plays Mashizu in Throne of Blood, has also starred in several other Kurosawa films. What animal is Mufune said to have studied the movements of in order to prepare for his roles? Look at that guy's face. For those of you on the uh, watching this on YouTube, what does this <laughs> man look like he's embodying right now? That probably doesn't help, but still. <laughs> Do you want me to go first on this one? It's going to be a total shot in the dark. Do it. So, especially his posture in Seven Samurai, I'm going to say some sort of like ape or like primate. Okay. That's that's my my guess. He looks fierce. And if I think fierce, I think tiger. So I'm just going to say tiger. <laughs> nice. So, May, I'd like to give you partial credit for this because while it is not a tiger, it is a lion. So yeah. I feel like that is... You know, it's, it's tiger close. adjacent. A large it's close. Cat. Yeah. yeah. Large feline. So, yeah. I think she so should get credit awesome. for them. Yes. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of jungle cats out there. <laughs> there are. And when you're getting ripped to shreds, like, are you really going to nitpick? <laughs> like, you know what I mean? <laughs> I could have said snow leopard. I could have said <laughs> cougar. Yeah. Mountain lion. Yeah. yeah. All the <laughs> iOS versions that Apple's come out with just start cranking out those animals you know? <laughs> all right number three and this one i'll give you a little bit of context for or multiple choice i should say um so rashomon which we've mentioned a few times <clears throat> is actually known for a couple of uh, or is, excuse me i should say is known for 
um, a sort of an interesting cinematic first. Uh, and so, or I shouldn't, uh, let me back up a bit. A, a cinematic, um, man, I should have like written this question better before this podcast. <laughs> we're going to just edit that out. No, we're just staying in. No. <laughs> I know. Yeah. I mean, like, no. Uh, so let me just, I'll, I'll make this a shorter question. What is Kurosawa's film Rashomon known for, uh, for those who have read up about it? Uh, is it A, the first time that the sun was filmed? Is it B, the use of retelling a story from multiple perspectives? Or C, the last film that Toshiro Mufune decided to collaborate on? I'm going to say A. B. The sun. Nice. Multiple perspectives. So you're actually both right. I have to, tried to make it a little, as typical for what I try to like throw a wrench and throw a little curveball in there, um, depending on the metaphor I want to use, which apparently I can't get that straight either. It doesn't work very well. And I just ended up <laughs> stepping over it, but um, <laughs> trying to throw, uh, trying to make it a little bit, you know, like on your toes. But the last one, the uh, the last film that Toshiro Mufune did was actually called Red Beard. And it was partially because Mufune wasn't given as prominent of a role since apparently he was kind of like the epitome of like the manliness in in uh, Japanese culture when the films were coming out. And since he kind of got relegated to a different role, uh, less prominent role, uh, he was disappointed with that. And then also apparently he had to keep a red beard for the for the movie. Um, and that process limited him to other uh, potential projects. Very strange and unfortunate, but uh, yeah. So there's that. But yeah, so uh, Rashomon was known for the first time that the sun was filmed and also to have a story that was retold from multiple perspectives. Number four, true or false? One of Kurosawa's first jobs in film was narrator, was a narrator rather, for silent pictures. I'm going to say true. Just to be contrary, because I, I can't stand a tie uh, false. Aw, you should have said true, Chris. But yeah, it's true. Yay! Yeah. So that puts me in the lead if my counting is correct going into you the are final correct one. by sheer luck <laughs> yeah and this, thanks and tiger. more than five but yeah <laughs> uh, so question number five as we have already discussed forbidden fortress is the film that george lucas repeatedly cites as his inspiration for the original star wars and for those who do watch it you can definitely see where he where what he's talking about uh specifically even in the opening shot uh, so which star wars characters are based on two peasants that we see at the beginning of kurosawa's film i also know this with certainty so i'm going to hold off you're winning don't don't give me the, 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 the puppy dog eyes. you're winning uh, it could be a tie might need a tiebreaker okay uh i'm going to say Luke's parents, like adoptive parents. Okay. The correct answer is R two D two and C three PO. Ah shit, <laughs> you are right. <laughs> yes, you are correct. But that's okay. Wait, what were they some... in Kurosawa's <laughs> They're like buffoons that sort of like are. <laughs> yeah. What okay. Yeah. Pushes the plot like forward yeah. in the beginning. They're the comic relief. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That 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 checks out. Yeah. So since we are now tied, I do have a tiebreaker for you because uh, nice. we can't leave it hanging. So clearly a victor must be must be crowned. Uh, the tiebreaking question is, what was the original what original profession did Kurosawa hope to achieve prior to his success in film? I went first on the last one, Chris. Uh, based on nothing more than like some of the early subject matter of like uh, some of his films, I'm going to say some sort of like police job, like detective, something like that. That would be cool. I'm going to say military. I'm going to say he had military aspirations. That would also have been interesting. However, neither of those is correct. Uh, uh, he wanted to be a painter. Oh, that's precious. Yeah. Sweet. I was just yeah. cheating off of Chris. <laughs> <Things like that>. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Uh, mm. Well, we could flip a coin if you don't have another question. Just we'll leave it to to fate, like the the spirit in the woods. So to speak. <laughs> I I will. Well, and I'm trying to think too because I don't know all of his uh, his filmography very well. So I'm trying to think if there was one other item that we could do. But... You could also just give it to Chris because I did get a generous point there with the, no, with the tiger. No, no, no. I was. I think that was fair. Mm. A we jungle could just cat, call it a like draw. Is, is, we could. We could both first tie two victories for the week. Yeah, we could have a tie. I. I am totally accepting of a tie. Cool. All right. Excellent. We'll, then we'll, everybody's we'll a winner. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody loses. Chris just Nobody doesn't want dies. a participation trophy, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> ah, it's, uh, you know, I, I feel like your point was fair, but it's, uh, it's okay. Um, just for shits and laughs, um, uh, heads or tails, May? <laughs> tails. Look at that. Is All this right. happening on screen so our viewers can verify? Oh no, hold on. Yeah, I didn't. Uh, you won that, but like, uh, <laughs> no, I'll tell you what I'll do. Don't do it again. Uh, I, forgot, <laughs> I, for, I forgot to switch the views. Yeah, I'll do it again until it happens. So, <laughs> until so until, it, until it actually becomes tails. Like, you got to keep flipping it now until you get the one shot. Oh, that you nope, see, it's it. heads. Oh, oh. it's heads again. <laughs> oh. Oh, uh-huh. since again. There I'm we go. You, man. May wins. Woo. Yay. <laughs> But for it, your it tie-breaking question, time, how many uh, kittens promise. were murdered in Milo and Otis? No. Oh my god. Yeah, geez. Oh boy. It's grim. <laughs> All right. Well played. Um, and thank you for the questions, Will. I loved them. Yeah. Even the curveball, because I also gave you guys curveballs. Awesome. Yeah, hey, I'm that. just trying to live up to the standard that's been set, man. So I appreciate that. <laughs> So I think what happened, like why, uh, so for our audience members, you you notice that like this card looks really weird is I think like it cut the deck twice, once with like real cards and then yeah. once with like the template kind of like jacked up. So I, I will figure this out, but I'm just going to gesture to this. Like I'm aware that uh, this looks weird down here. We'll get it fixed by the next episode, but um, just going to call that out there. Sweet. Well, let's see what, what our next movie is going to be in the meantime. Um, I'm hoping for a new category, personally, but we'll see. It happens and... for the side quest. There's always a chance. <laughs> it is another you've never seen. Oh, noise. And if you'll hold for a moment. <laughs> do, do, do. Mm, it is West Side Story for Chris. So my nomination again. And uh, this is the OG West Side Story. So not the Spielberg one. Um, although this will probably motivate me to like watch the uh, the other adaptation because I'm just weird like that and I want to see like in compare and contrast. But yeah, so the original West Side Story is going to be our next film. Have That's either of you noise. seen it? No, no, actually, me either. You know why? It's also fitting. Anybody want to get some extra credit here? Shakespeare. It's- Right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. It is an adaptation <laughs> of Nailed Romeo it. and Juliet. Remember how we said, like, hey, like on the podcast, like coincidences just like happen. Mm. You watch me shuffle the cards. I didn't intend it, but we're doing back to back Shakespeare adaptations for films. Personally, I think it's a bit like horoscopes. It's like we'll find we'll find the connections because we want to see them. That's it's a really... pretty obvious connection. I'm just gonna say. I mean, I think it's really just more that everything in Hollywood builds off of what came before it, right? Sure. It's yeah. fate. It was it is also happen. fate. No, yeah. I'm a skeptic. <laughs> <laughs> it's chance Listen and to probability. Crazy eyes. It's fate. <laughs> hey, I look forward to this. This is one of my parents' like favorite uh, like musicals, and I'm very picky. Oh when it comes to musicals so i'm i'm curious to see if this is going to fall into like the i love it or hate it category because there's not really many in between musicals that i like just for i don't know like no other reason than to put it out there singing in the rain chicago Mm -hmm. sweeney todd um la la land musicals i don't like oklahoma Mm -hmm. um sound of music it's like all right so like that's kind of where my tastes like are i don't know so we'll see. I have a feeling I'm going to like this one, though. The subject matter seems pretty cool. So, 
Excellent. We'll talk next week. And uh, yeah, for audience members that may not know, this category is just as simple as it sounds. It's a pile of shame film that we're we're scratching off like the list. And we'll talk about uh, talk about it next week. All right. Sounds good. Last thing to plug before we go. Sorry. Uh, yeah. We will have a Google <laughs> form linked to this episode. Yeah. We'll plug it on social media. So you, the audience, can now suggest a side quest or a main quest um, film within like the topics that we have. If you want to be a host, make sure you indicate that you would like to be a host on the show as a guest uh, when we pull your card. We will be going through those as we receive them. And of course, give credit one way or the other if we draw one of those audience uh, submissions. So engage with that. We would love to have more side quest ideas and um, some some more films in the in the mix to um, you know just kind of build out our decks a little bit. But we, we do appreciate that. But till next week. We love you. Goodbye. Bye, Bye guys.